Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Clement, one of the program specialists with the task team at the National Rural Health Resource Center. Uh, breakout sessions and plenary sessions are being recorded. If someone is having technical difficulties, please utilize the chat feature and I can assist you. Please use the chat feature as well if you have questions for our speakers. Uh, Zoom closed captioning is enabled for this event. If this is an option you would like to utilize, click on the CC button on the bottom ribbon then select live transcript, then select show subtitles. If you are needing further instructions or assistance, please indicate in a private message within the chat box and I would be happy to assist you moving forward. So welcome to this session about CAW conversion. Uh, speakers from Arizona, North Dakota and South Dakota state flex programs will present their efforts to support hospitals in their states during the CAW conversion process. This presentation will overview the steps and tools in the transition of becoming a critical access hospital. Our learning objectives include um, participants at the conclusion of this presentation, participants will be able to identify potential hospitals for cost status, including Indian Health Service Hospitals or IHS. An increasing number of hospitals, including IHS hospitals are reassessing their financial status and choosing to convert to cost status. Um, and also learn how a multi-state collaboration between these three flex programs supports their hospitals during the conversion process with steps and tools in the transition of becoming a critical access hospital. So to introduce our speakers, Jill Bullock has been with the Center for uh, Rural Health and working on the Arizona Flex program since 2011. She has over 25 years of experience working in government and nonprofit entities in healthcare marketing and outreach to the underserved. In 2014, Joe became the flex coordinator supporting Arizona's 16 critical access hospitals and their 38 affiliated rural health clinics. In 2015, she was appointed the associate director of the Center for Rural Health. Jody Ward is a program director with the Center for Rural Health at the University of North Dakota, UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She directs activities of the North Dakota Flex Program and the North Dakota Critical Access Hospital Quality Network. Jody has been with the North Dakota Center since 2008. She has led the North Dakota uh, CA Quality Network in a number of quality and patient safety initiatives. She serves as a liaison to state, statewide stakeholders, facilitating the exchange of information and network development. Jody has a Master of Science degree in Advanced Public Health Nursing from the University of North Dakota and an RN Bachelor's degree from Minot State University. And Michelle uh, Hoffman is the Rural Hospital Program Coordinator at the South Dakota Office of Rural Health and is located in Spearfish. Michelle's responsibilities include the coordination of the South Dakota Flex Program and SHIP Program, also SHIP COVID and SHIP COVID testing and mitigation. Michelle has worked with the FLEX program for 11 years in the states of Wyoming and South Dakota. So with that, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna kick it off for us. Thank you, Nicole. Um, as Nicole said, my name is Jill Bullock from the Arizona Center for Rural Health. And I'm gonna let my colleagues, Jody and Michelle introduce her, themselves as well. Yeah, and I guess not much more to say after that beautiful introduction from Nicole. So Jody Ward, Program Director from um, UND Center for Rural Health. Thanks again, Nicole. This is Michelle from South Dakota. Welcome. Jill, take it away. Okay, I think I'm up on this one, so I'll jump in. Yep, so we just, the objectives for today, um, again, expect the unexpected. Um, we named this Adventures in COG Conversion, and our goal is to help identify potential hospitals for cause status, including IHS, as um, Nicole had described in the um, objectives earlier. And then we just really wanna take the time today to make this session interactive and kind of explain to you how Arizona um, South Dakota, North Dakota, how we came together, how did we um, form this multi-state collaboration? Um, but before we do, we do today too, really want to focus on the IHS perspective. Certainly what we talk about, the COG conversion will be helpful to you if you haven't gone through the COG conversion, um, but specifically, we're gonna give you some helpful hints around working with IHS facilities. 
Um, so before we kind of start, if you want to put in the chat box, we are also curious how many have you gone through COG conversion? I know back in 1997, the FLEX program we all know started from then. Um, so for some of us, like myself, even though I've been with Center for Rural Health since 2008, I had not gone through a COG conversion. And I think same, Michelle, was that your Absolutely. I've never had one before. And then Jill kind of, and during her, her time, you know, time she's went through it. So just curious how, how many on here have or haven't, if you'll just kind of weigh in in the chat box and, and we'll, um, we'll give a count on that here in a minute. So how did we kind of get together on this multi-state collaboration amongst the three states? Um, I was approached then, we have 36 critical access hospitals. We're gonna show on a map here in a bit. And um, our 37th CAW now that just became CAW, it took two years to get that in place, but it is an IHS facility. I didn't really have a guide or know what to do. Heard that Jill in Arizona has gone through this and especially working with IHS. So I reached out to Jill. She had this beautiful guide already made up. So she was so gracious and shared it with me. I took that guide and, um, and we'll talk a little deeper about some of the, how we switched it up to make it, customize it for North Dakota. And then Michelle, I think similar? Similar. Um, I was approached by an IHS facilities right away when I first moved back to South Dakota and then nothing came of it. And so all of a sudden uh, this last fall, I was notified that they have actually had a, a different IHS facility had actually applied. So it wasn't even the same IHS facility that contacted us. So it, it is, um, you know, circumvented around our office completely. And then just for the cause here that have threw in uh, the chat box, there's a couple that have gone through it and a couple that haven't. So those of you that have, it's been 2016, 2018, some of this, and I don't know if it was IHS that you went through. So hopefully this will be helpful hints for you. Um, and uh, those that haven't gone through it, hopefully you'll find some, uh, some takeaways. Through. And then Jill, your history with this. Um, we came to you and that's kind of how we started our collaboration. We learned that IHS, South Dakota, Arizona, North Dakota, that certainly North Dakota, South Dakota can learn from what Jill's been through. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to add to that, um, we have uh, two IHS hospitals in Arizona, and we can talk about our states in the next in our yeah. next one. Um, so Arizona now has sixteen cause. We we had we just uh, finished designating one, um, so we're at sixteen, and we're also uh, working on a designation for another one, but. Um, our hospitals in Arizona, and you might be able to read this map, but it's pretty small. Um, it's, we have a variety of critical access hospitals in Arizona. And so we've got um, two that are IHS critical access hospitals and two that are tribal 638s. And I'll go into what a tribal 638 hospital is in a later slide. Um, and we've got two that are part of a banner system and one that's part of um, tenant system and the rest are independent. And um, so it, it's, it's definitely a variety of critical access hospitals in Arizona, but Jody and Michelle came to me um, because they were seeing requests for IHS facilities to become critical access hospitals. And that is that is a trend going on right now throughout the country as IHS is really uh, looking to turn most of their small hospitals into critical access hospitals if they aren't already. Yeah, and I'll jump in then. The next map um, is North Dakota. And we were laid out kind of nicely where we're able to do like a hub and spoke. So the dark X's, you can see those are our six big facilities. We call them the six big. There are PPS hospitals, but everything else that you see, the little blue H's are our critical access hospitals. We have two IHS facilities, and it was really the one that Sport Yates at south of the green and the blue big X's there. You'll see it towards south of the state, um, bordering South Dakota just about. 
Um, so Fort Yates is our IHS facility that did the COG conversion. Um, again, took two years and they do uh, have their number. And, and so now we have 37 critical access hospitals. But their position of where they're at on our map, you'll, you'll see the natural slide how we started working with South Dakota. Because <laughs> our Fort Yates has patients coming from South Dakota and part of their clinics are in South Dakota. So that led Michelle and I having to connect and have same people at the table for conversation, but yet we needed Jill's guidance on those calls. So that's another reason why we formed this three-way collaborative. Yeah. And just as Jody said, I had 38 hospital, critical access hospitals um, in the state for, for forever. And um, we just, the Eagle Butte Hospital, which if you look at Jody's map, I didn't have a pretty map to put in there. So if you look at Jody's map, if you look toward the, the very bottom middle part of the map, that's where South Dakota's um, Eagle Butte Hospital IHS facility would be located. And so um, that is the hospital that just became a critical access hospital in May, May 13th of, of 2022. Um, and they are considered, they are not seeking the tribal 638. So they will still be under IHS as Jill will, um, will get into. I do have one more hospital that is looking, uh, IHS facility that is looking at moving to critical access hospital, and they would be in the lower um, southern um, part of the uh, of the South Dakota in kind of the, um, it's called on Rosebud Reservation. So it'd be the southwestern side of the state. So a um, little bit of identify or information about the FLEX program. You know, to, reiter to reiterate of what we've heard over the past two days through all these presentations that we've been um, having, the Medicare Rural Hospital Flexibility Program was established in 1997, as we all know, through the Balanced Budget Act. Um, the FLEX program is designed to strengthen rural health care delivery systems by supporting critical access hospitals, and all FLEX programs are required to organize efforts around the core areas of quality improvement, operational and, and financial improvement, health system development and community engagement, rural EMS improvement, and then the conversion of small rural hospitals to critical access hospitals. Thus our kind of our presentation today. So flex funding is to provide support to these vulnerable critical access hospitals in a challenging um, healthcare environment, particularly in the areas of these um, core areas of improvement. So as the title suggests, you know, expect the unexpected. Um, and here's a few strategies that we're going to present today, you know, of what you can do. Um, you know, just some of the things that I know that we did, and I will be the first to say that, um, you know, all these strategies that I thought we had in place, it still fell short that we did not know that this hospital, the IHS facility was even um, seeking, a, you know, seeking the critical access hospital designation. You know, most of the time we do not work with IHS facilities and um, don't have a lot of interaction, I'll say, between with our office with them. But if you could network with, you know, with your hospital association to see if they are aware of any, any potential changes, um, you know, get to know your regular and have conversations with your state licensing um, office. In fact, like I said, um, they are the first office that let our office know, the Office of Rural Health know, that the IHS facility was even seeking um, designation because they received the joint commission letter. So that was the first time I knew in our office that this IHS facility was even seeking a credit or seeking a CH status. Um, you know, get to know and, and have conversations with other state licensing and partners, as I said, and just um, contact your, your local um, healthcare management financial, uh, you know, HFMA association. They may have um, heard conversations. You know, sometimes it isn't the hospital that's contacting them, but they get information through other stakeholders and partners. So just make sure that you're networking constantly to get some of these, um, to get to know your hospitals in your state. Mm -hmm. I think well said too, because often um, the ho you know the hospitals they don't always know to contact us, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a hit and miss whether we find out appropriately. So yeah, good ideas. So this is Jody and Michelle again to just kind of give a your perspective. I know you went over some of this already. 
Yeah. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, uh, we were not aware of the IHS facility seeking accreditation. I also had two PPS hospitals through a system hospital. Um, and I guess I didn't preface in my la in the last slide. I have in the state of South Dakota, there's out of the 38 hospitals, and that including the IHS that just converted, um, two thirds are, are affiliated with a system. So uh, about a third are independent hospitals. So I had two PPS hospitals through a major system hospital um, that circumvented the Office of Rural Health and just started going through uh, um, seeking a CH status. But then due to some legislative, state legislative processes in the in the in February, one has now um, withdrawn their application for critical access hospital status. So I still may have another one, a PPS hospital converting now, plus an additional IHS facility. But as this slide shows, you know, even though our manual states that we should, that those hospitals should um, let the Office of Rural Health know and be in touch with the Office of Rural Health, as we found out through this process, it has not happened. So we just have to go with the flow and work with what we have and keep going. Yep. Um, same Same for North Dakota, like um, it says too, that they don't always uh, know to reach out to us. Well, we did understand that our IHS facility was in the process of uh, conversion. Um, that provided me an opportunity to say that we um, are able to kind of have steps that we can help walk them through uh, and guide them. And so we started setting up uh, weekly calls with the IHS and then turned into, um, you know, networking with Michelle and um, kind of a coordinated effort. One of the things that I learned when the IHS did reach out to us is that um, back in the day, back when our program was um, deep into helping with COG conversion, when it first started happening, so 1997, you know, the early 2000s, feasibility studies uh, or the FLEX program helped fund that. Well, when the IHS facility then reached out to me, they had already done their own feasibility study. So that was, had they not done a feasibility study, that was the unexpected for me as the flex pro, in the FLEX program in our budget. Because uh, those can get pretty expensive and I would not have budgeted for that. So we'll talk about that here in a few minutes down the road, but that was the unexpected and good on them that they had already done the feasibility study. Um, so that opened the door to our program. Okay, well then what are some other things that we can help them? And then we'll talk about that in a few slides. And I wanted to add, um, so this is where I wanna explain what a tribal 638 is. It's a public law, 96-638. Um, so in, in a nutshell, Th these are tribal facilities that receive dollars from the federal IHS to run independently. And um, so many, I think all of Alaska's tribal cause are tribal 638s and, and not, not IHS facilities. So the difference is an IHS facility is Indian Health Services they are funded directly from the federal government, whereas the tribal 638s are, are funded but run very independently, as I said. So another um, un unexpected is that we had, excuse me, two hospitals sure. de-licensed beds. So that was not on our radar at all. They did come to us for support very early on, they knew that they had to contact their state offices of rural health, which they did, but they were not on our radar. So uh, the point is, is that you should, that should be on your radar. If you've got some small rural hospitals that aren't utilizing those beds, they may, they may look into becoming a CA. Um, and they, and so our newest one, which is Mount Graham and Safford, they too did their own feasibility study and it turned out yeah delicensing beds was was gonna save them over a million dollars and so they are our newest critical access hospital so again keep that on your radar if if 
if you have some small rural hospitals because they they are probably looking at this cost status. And if they're not, wouldn't you say too, it isn't, you know, think to do the outreach yourself. If you know, just do a spot check-in. You know, we they may not reach out to you like we say, but you could reach out to them and maybe even just sort of um, plant the idea of an IHS or like Jill said, the 638 status. And we have another one that's eligible that we've kept on our radar and we touch base with them often about cost status. Um, they they've they've had a lot of leadership changes and and they're inundated with things that so it hasn't been easy for them to to kind of commit the resources to to working on their cost status so on this slide um we did an assessment uh, or had an assessment done to both our ihs hospitals back in, I think, 2012 or 2013. And they wanted to make sure that their, that being a critical access hospital was beneficial for them. So this is just where, where this is saving in the yellow. Um, they were saving six, $1,600,000 being a cost. So it's strictly financial reasons to become a cost. So I just wanted, wanted to show you that, that analysis that was done. And this was done after they were a critical access hospital, but they were doubting um, should they really be a critical access hospital. So then uh, next slide, did I have you start this one? I last track here, were you starting and then I jump in? The de-licensing? Um, no, this is yours. Okay. Um, so you talked about the deem licensing, the same reason. These are hospitals not on our radar. <clears throat> and um, we talked about the FLEX program support feasibility study. Um, there's an example of a feasibility study that shows benefits, and that's what Jill just showed you. But also something, something to think about um, as we are building our budgets that, you know, a feasibility study can be costly up to $10,000 um, at times. I'm not sure if it broke down the on that slide before I forgot to look, Jill, but when it's about that. So um, some, something to think about because if you're kind of caught off guard in the middle of a, a flex budget cycle, you might not have 10,000 extra to help this facility. Um, and I don't know if that's a plan that you want to build into your programs, but, um, but it is a way for flex to um, be helpful. So what I had said earlier is that by the time that IHS contacted us, they'd already done that. So we thought to help them with their billing and coding analysis. And a way to do this would be to, um, we reached out to I Bailey, but there are other groups do it as well. And they were willing to look at the bill, billing and coding system. They call it doing a scrubbing of their um, billing system to make sure that they're billing um, at the appropriate levels to get the biggest re return um, and um, um, payment. So for our facility, this was all in place and started to do some of the pre-work and then all of a sudden they pulled out of it. And um, so it was just, they, I don't know if it became mistrust or just they became uncomfortable or they truly felt that they could handle it. Um, internally, what they said to us is that they wanted to back out of the agreement. They got started on it and felt like they could handle this internally. Um, and that is exactly what happened with South Dakota as well. Yep. Yeah. So I know sometimes, you know, um, communication was lacking when we worked with the groups. Or honestly, it's just a whole different um, process and systems that they have. And um, things kind of get caught into like, they always uh, talk about the elders and the running things past them. And it seems like it's very, um, takes a lot of time to kind of make it through all of their system. So by the time it worked itself up at one level, they said it was okay. And at another level, um, the plug got pulled. So that's fine. We're just gonna reroute the dollars in different ways to assist them. Um, one thing to know as an IHS facility that we learned through Jill, and Jill helped me explain this, that with our flex dollars, 
we're not able to reimburse for mileage. There are certain things that working with an IHS facility, we cannot reimburse and do. Um, however, how we did work about it is that we could pay I daily directly to conduct the feasibility study. We just could not give the dollars directly to, to the facility because of the federal dollars. And Jill, can you maybe go deeper on that? Well, so, so for IHS facilities, we can't support things like their travel or attending events because it's considered double dipping because they, they get federal funds and we use federal funds. That is not the case with the tribal 638. Um, so I just wanna make that clear. So when we wanna support an IHS hospital, like with a charge master review, or uh, we just did a, um, a swing bed assessment we contracted directly with, with the, the person or the company that was gonna do the swing bed assessment. And we contracted with them, did the purchase order on our end, and then the work was done in that facility. So things like that are allowed. And sometimes you have to be a little creative um, to support the hospitals, but the same, the same um, things apply with MBQIP. If they're not participating, then you can't support the hospital in, in, in those areas. And it was working with these hospitals, you know, um, through Jody and through the Eagle Butte Hospital, um, because they are so connected, not just um, close to on reservation, but because some of the same participants were in both facilities, or, or, or areas in the area office. That's how this work group came about too. So we can interact. We've had meetings with um, the IHS billing and coding and CEOs. We have this work group going, which we'll get into, but that's how the, that work group came about too. And so we could have these kinds of discussions, how we can collaboratively between the three states, what kind of assistance can we provide um, you know, as a group um, that would assist all, all the hospitals. So that's a nice segue into our multi-state collaborative. Um, and the reason we, we created this collaborative was that in Arizona, well, the flex coordinators are, most, most flex coordinators have never, have never done this before, have never um, gone through the co-application. And um, so fortunately for um, Arizona, um, and I don't know if Joyce is on, um, she might be, Joyce has been here from the very beginning and she has really, um, yep, she's on. Hi, Joyce. Um, she really walked us through the whole process and was, is, is just was stellar with working with these hospitals. And so she has guided our hospitals and myself on this, on the CA application. So kudos to Joyce. Um, and then the federal office of rural health policy was coming to Arizona to give technical assistance to the other states. And then, so we began, Arizona began working with North Dakota back in 2019, I heard from Jody. And then um, Arizona shared their call manual with, with, um, with both um, North Dakota and South Dakota, but then Michelle found out later on and that Montana and South Dakota were the were part of a pilot project in 1999. So we began this multi-state collaborative and by having calls to really bring technical assistance to IHS facilities um, going through the cost status. All right, this is still me. So our collaborative includes our partners um, converting um, to cost status. So um, it's, it's us at the Arizona Center for Rural Health, the North Dakota Center for Rural Health and the South Dakota Department of Health, but it includes PATH, which is Partnerships to Advance Tribal Health. They have contracts to work with um, IHS facilities, not the tribal 638s. So um, they've been um, very important in supporting the critical access hospitals in their cost status. 
And then we pulled together our IHS um, established cause to offer support and technical assistance. And then the Great Plains Area Office has also been participating as well as the Great Plains Area Office of South Dakota. So we're still growing and we still want, um, you know, participation from more um, IHS facilities to offer technical, you know, assistance to have these um, these cause succeed. And we also want to make sure that we're not, um, uh, uh, you know, like, stepping on others toes from like for the PATH program. So make sure that we are in collaboration, that we're not duplicating efforts. And so that's why they're an integral part partner in um, the meetings with IHS facilities. So we wanna make sure that you all know where to get support. Um, I don't know if everybody has a call manual on their website or not. And if you don't, you might wanna update that and, um, place it on your website. And then um, we have a checklist on, on, on one of the next slides. And you want to make sure you leave some dollars in area six on your work plans um, to support the critical access hospitals. And it might just be staff time in the beginning, but um, you wanna, you wanna be able to support them in, in a needs assessment or um, maybe even just working on their billing and coding scrubbing. But, but the feasibility study is the first thing that, that the hospitals need. And sometimes they might need a little bit of support um, with the feasibility studies because they can, they can be pretty expensive. I was gonna share too that in area six, initially I had you know, our state working with that facility, our IHS facility, and then since then, I've kind of kept the line going just because this collaboration started and we started, you know, the topic is still there. So I'm still speaking to it in that area six, even though they have, um, they, the facility has now uh, received their CCN number. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I think just telling that story of the collaboration and those that are near us and want to join, if maybe there's more, this doesn't have to just stay North Dakota, South Dakota, Arizona. There could be more states that want to join us and we could, you know, kind of grow from there and learn. I think the more we can connect these IHS facilities nationwide is important too. And years ago, Joyce, Joyce and I were really trying to get an IHS CA network together. Um, it Minnesota had was was participating, but we really didn't get a get a really good um momentum going on that and, and and it's it it's something we we'd still like to do and so these these are our first steps of really um getting this going we do have a question in the chat box do you have an estimated number of dollars you'd recommend setting aside for cost conversion in our budgets um definitely staff but i would say um maybe twenty thousand. Yeah, and we did around 10. Um, don't know that we're going to write that in again, but uh, this time, because I, I have a pulse kind of on the other IHS facility at this time, and there's no real movement I don't see coming. But before you each cycle of flex, I would say be reaching out to those IHS facilities so you're not caught off guard. Are they thinking or talking about it? Then that will help you judge on how much TA you want to uh, provide as a flex program. So you just want to talk about some other tips. So um, the proximity of an IHS tribal hospitals and non-tribal hospitals are not considered in the determination of, of a call location. And what this means is a, a IHS, an IHS hospital still needs to um, be 35 miles from another IHS hospital but they can be closer to a non IHS hospital because they do not see the same um, population. And here's a link in the decisions of that in, in our um, presentation, if you wanted to, if you wanted more information. And this came about um, 
the hospital decision in New Mexico kind of paved the way for, for this decision. And in Arizona, we actually have a critical access hospital and an IHS critical access hospital that are about a mile apart from each other. And at first, they, the, the IHS hospital was already a critical access hospital and at the time didn't need a necessary provider letter, um, which I'll go into in a minute, to become that critical access hospital. And then many years down the road, um, La Paz Regional Hospital was going after their designation and got, got it that this rule was not made effective yet. And so they had trouble getting their cost status. But then now it's written in the rules that any critical access hospital and an IHS hospital don't have to meet those uh, necessary mileage. And so I don't know if any of you know what the necessary provider is that was hospitals that were less than 35 miles from another hospital and they deemed necessary providers and they got letters and that stopped in 2006. So um, any hospital that's trying to come in closer to a critical access hospital would not be able to meet those um, less than 35 miles. But the ones that are and have the necessary provider letter, they can continue being a call. So this is a long list. This is our checklist. Um, the next two slides are a checklist that you can use to walk your hospitals through the call application. Same here. There's two pages. And this is our call manual. So um, we've got the checklists on our website and we work with them diligently through the checklist and use anything that we need to follow up on and make sure all their T's are crossed and their I's are dotted. And because Joyce has not had one application returned or denied. And she has taught me her tricks. <laughs> And um, you have to be very diligent with the hospitals when you're working with them. Jill, just also I'll add is how um, we have worked with licensure. Even though the tribal facilities are not licensed by the state of Arizona, we do have the licensure folks review the application before we send it off to CMS. So that's another thing where they could be really very supportive of making sure, because they have a different eye of um, making sure things are, are there. And so that's just another point that we have found very, very valuable to uh, work with uh, uh, state licensure. And, and good point. And we did put that in the manual. Um, however, we, we didn't discuss that. It was, that's a great point, Joyce. Thank you for adding that. Yeah. Um, and the yeah, the other thing I wanted to just to briefly add was when you mentioned the example of uh, Parker, the two hospitals on our west side of our state, what's really interesting about that, they're both critical access hospitals, but how the Indian Health Service Hospital does contract with the, the regular CA for services, so because they can't provide everything. And so that's really been a, a wonderful example of they're one mile from each other, but the the, the non ca the non IHS facility does get contracts from the IHS facility for certain services, which is pretty cool. And good, they have a good relationship; they work together. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so then what happens when the critical access or IHS facility gets their CMS number? And the CMS number is another way of calling it. Sometimes it's referred to as their Medicare provider number and or it stands for um, CMS certification number or CCN number. So you might hear that kind of all that said. The CCN number, some of you might be familiar with when we report to the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy on the Emergency Department Transfer Communication Measures, we send in their data 
Applies Flex programs on the template when you add their CCN numbers thing. So when they get a uh, their CCN number after completing the application and the guidebook that Jill just walked through, then the next thing our Flex programs do is we set up a site visit. We ask them to sign an MOU for the MB Clip program, the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Program, and set up an orientation to what is MB Clip. And um, then uh, Jill, she's had some back experience with IHS reporting on the GPRA. And this is just, GPRA is really just, it's an acronym, or it's not an acronym is what I'm trying to say. No, it, it is an acronym, the GIPRA measures. It's for YX, yeah, in its joint commission, joint performance measures. And you probably, you can speak to this better, but how it overlaps with MB Clip. Yeah, so, so um, one of the things that I've been trying to work with Natalia Vargas um, is to really align these measures. So the IHS facilities aren't reporting the same measures in many different places. It's, it's been an ongoing battle. Um, IHS reports a lot of measures. The GIPRA measures are, um, a lot of them are, the immunization measures are in there and diabetes population health measures are in there. And, um, and the Oryx measures are from the joint commission that they're reporting on as well. And some of those are left without being seen. Um, so it's just like, you think that regular MB quit measures have many places to um, report. They are duplicating these measures in different areas. Yeah. And so what we're hearing currently from our IHS facility is some of the measures that we're asking them now to report on, they're doing it, but there's, um, they're holding back on sharing the data. They need the people at the hospital level feel okay to share it, but they need approval from the elders. So again, this is working its way through the system of IHS and getting elder tribal and the I, IHS are sovereign nations and they don't like to share their information. So you will, you, will have, you will have trouble trying to get them to report measures publicly. They, they like to keep the measures within, within their own governing board and, and within their own little, their, they have like their own little health system. All right. This, um, Kind of this concludes our presentation and we'd love to open this up for questions um, and, and wish you all luck. But, but just, just know that expect the unexpected. That's why we did title it that because um, hospitals are looking at ways to saving money. And Jill, um, so Kyle, Kyle is asking technical assistance does task provide um, and I'm, I'm sorry if I missed it, but I feel like you were saying that the guide is generic right now that you were working on, that we all three have kind of worked towards cleaning up and want to pass it on to task as a draft and have them take it over from here. We've had our tribal group look at it to the best once they uh, work, work their way through that help guide. There were things that they suggested they felt would have been helpful knowledge to them. And we've tried to enter that as best as, as best we can. Jill has looked at it several times. Michelle has. My team has. So I think we're to a point where it's a draft and we're going to pass it on to TASC. Yeah. And to answer your question, Kyle, TASC used to send them to me. <laughs> I've, so. also, I've also answered questions, I think, to Kyle, even when Kyle yeah. first started kind of what the federal level process is, because that's generally how task answers questions is kind of from that federal perspective. And then anything that's specific in your state, we aren't gonna be aware of. So um, that's generally what we've done, but I would be absolutely be interested in working with you guys to figure out the next steps for that manual now that it's in a more generalized perspective instead of being so state specific, so. So what do you recommend if, like I'm aware of three hospitals that are being built in Wyoming that are going to want cod designation. What do you recommend to just, 
Um, meet with, do you guys meet regularly? Do you meet quarterly? How do you join your collaboration? We were meeting once a month and, and feel free to join our collaboration, but I would reach out to the hospitals right now. Um, and right now our work group is, is an IHS work group though. Um, kind of what we've been, is that, the, is that what you're asking Kyle? So th no, but that's good clarification, Michelle, that you're specifically talking about IHS. I think one of the hospitals is on our reservation, but the other two are not. And I don't know at this moment if it's an IHS. So that's a good point, Jill, is to find out now. And I almost for collaboration um, because our IHS have started to fall since they, they now have become a cause status. Um, but as far as collaborating, I think at a flex program level, maybe collaborating at that level, we could join a call here or there. Um, but for us to take notes and like me, Jill or Michelle to drive a collaborative call, um, we're not formalized. But as needed, let's say as needed, if the group needs to come together, we're here for you as another of other flex programs. Let's say it that way. But pulling our hospitals together started really strong. And we were meeting like every two weeks, every month yeah. was at the height. And then yeah. all of a sudden, uh, like I say, whatever happened, all of a sudden they dropped out of wanting to do that billing and coding. Michelle's state dropped off and it's sort of been crickets. And then pretty soon the data, it's like, well, no, now we can't share our data. We have to get that. So all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. And um, we thought the calls were going good. I thought it was going well. And so I don't think it's anything we've done. I think it's their systems. I think it's just their processes and having to get approval for things. You know, they were asking us for um, like cross path, crosswalks for um, between the IHS billing and coding versus the CAH. And we were working with I Bailey to try and get something like that together. That would be in, in fact, it would have to, it couldn't be something as a joint because all of them are different. However, we were trying to get something specific for each one and those didn't, that fell through as well. So like, like Jody said, we're, we're trying to take their perspective and, and um, listen to what they're asking for us to provide to them. And then we look into it and then it's, then we don't have, and it's kind of crickets again. So it, it's a work in progress and we're still gonna um, pursue and, and keep moving forward. So um, it's, it's just something that will keep going. Kyle, I think, I think the point that was made earlier about having money in Program Area 6 for those financial assessments. So to Jody's point, reach out to those three hospitals that you're aware of and find out if they're thinking they might need that support from you so that you can be planning for that for your next program year. Go ahead, Sally. It's like a very daunting thing to have a hospital get this CA designation. It, it'll take you a good year and a half or so. Um, and then I... Um, CMS um, was so backlogged and with COVID, nobody was working in the offices and, and it, it was a challenge getting the applications to them. And they, it turned out that our licensing division at Arizona Department of Health Services, they've got a special portal that they communicate with CMS with. So they were actually the ones that uploaded the app the the um, IHS application, the Tribal 638 that we just did, because they can't their their systems reject our box folders, so you're going to have some workarounds with that too. So really work closely with your with your health department um, bureau of licensing if you don't already. Can we go over time if I'm looking at our agenda? Are we over time? Well, we started a little late, so we're finishing a little late, <laughs> but we are really at the end of our time. Um, another thing I just want to throw out there too, and maybe Jill, Jody, and Michelle, did you guys ever reach out to your CMS regional rural health coordinator at all in yes. any of your, okay. So that would be another thing, Kyle, to keep in mind too, is you have that CMS regional rural health coordinator that was mentioned yesterday. And if you don't have that person's information, I can share that with you. Keep that in mind as you're going through the COD designation process. And that's and, a checklist 
<laughs> yes, the checklist. Yeah, thank you. And this is so valuable from working with tribes and IHS because the new rural emergency hospital mm -hmm. designation, um, tribal and IHS hospitals are under 49 beds. So kind of that ship size and location, but tribal and IHS are eligible for rural emergency hospital conversions as well. So I think the lessons learned you've brought um, will really be helpful um, to flex programs since that, as you heard through the, Laura's email this week, there'll be some um, support to flex programs for education and awareness. All right, we are at the end of our time. So we are now, uh, thank you, Jill, Jody, Michelle, Kyle, for your questions, um, all of you for attending. This was fantastic. And now you guys all know where to go when you have PAW designation questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we are now adjourning for a break until 1.45 p.m. Central Time, so 15 minutes from now. Um, after that break, join us for our presentation on new tools to support rural health leadership. And you can find a link to that session in the attendee hub. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Or in the chat box. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thanks.